recording? Yeah. All right. Basul, Wabano, Kewiak, Migma, Ak, Talawisi, Tyler Everett. Greetings. I'm a person of the dawn and I am Migma, and my name is Tyler Everett. Thank you all for joining us today uh, for the fifth webinar in the USAP Forest and Wetland Webinar Training Series. I'm the Forest Adaptation Technical Assistant with United South and Eastern Tribes, or USET, and I'll be hosting today's webinar. Today's webinar is being recorded, uh, as Steph just keyed off for us. And once the recording is processed, I'll post it to the USET YouTube page. And as a, a lot of you have probably seen, the follow-up emails that I send out will have that recording. I'm still working on the last webinar. Uh, follow-up email. Once that's ready, it'll go out and you should have access to the recording. Um, before we get started, uh, I wanted to pass it over to uh, the other USET staff on the call today. Uh, so first I'll pass it off to my supervisor, Dr. Casey Thornbrew, for a quick introduction. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, everyone, uh, Natasha's Casey Thornbrew. Uh, good day, everyone. My name is Casey Thornbrew, and I'm a citizen of the Mashi Wampanoag tribe. Um, I serve as uh, USET's uh, tribal climate science uh, liaison, uh, as well as the program manager for USET's uh, climate resilience program. I've uh, been in the position for uh, five years now, and in my uh, role as uh, tribal, climate uh, tribal climate science liaison, I work to connect uh, tribal nation um, departments and agencies uh, with uh, personnel and resources at regional climate adaptation science centers or CA CASCs as they're called. Um, I work very closely with the Northeast CASC uh, and the Southeast CASC um, and also work closely with uh, my uh, fellow liaison, um, April Taylor, who serves uh, in a very similar position uh, as mine with the South Central CASC. Um, and uh, USET, our USET region works with uh, 33 tribal nations all the way from the uh, Northeast Woodlands to the Everglades and across to um, Alabama Cachada tribe um, homelands. Um, so very glad to be here really enjoying this webinar series. Uh, this webinar has been, series has been funded by a Bureau of Indian Affairs Tribal Resilience Grant um, we were awarded. So uh, a lot of work to put into uh, bringing you all to these spaces virtually. Um, I will go ahead and pass it to our, our newest staff, uh, Dr. Steph Courtney, um, uh, who has joined our team. And uh, uh, Steph, I'll have you introduce yourself. Hi, yes, I'm Steph Courtney, just finished a PhD in climate change and climate communication, and I am now the assistant climate science, tribal climate science liaison, many different titles, depending on which documents you're looking at and whatnot. Uh, and I'm at the beginning of week four now, so time flies, amazing stuff. Um, yeah, that's about it. Very similar duties to Casey, still figuring it all out, and it's uh, it's a good time. And I believe that is all for the USET staff um, uh, for today's uh, webinar. Awesome, thank you, Casey. Um, before we move along to the next slide, I would like to give uh, both Jesse and uh, Dr. Marianne Sayer an opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, Jesse, do you wanna introduce yourself first? Sure. Jesse Bullock, I'm the fire management specialist for the Alabama Cachada Tribe of Texas. Um, been in this position since 2018. Um, before that, I had a long, uh, good career with the Forest Service, U.S. Forest Service, and uh, learned a lot from them. Had the opportunity to come to the tribe and start a new program, uh, fire and fuels management here at the tribe. Um, the tribe really needed it. Before then, there wasn't any of that active management, um, any burning, any mechanical treatments going on here at the tribe. And so um, I uh, took what I learned at the U.S. Forest Service and brought it here to the tribe. And um, here the past few years, I've been doing a lot of good work. So I appreciate the time. Uh, Tyler, I know you've been coordinating left and right. And um, yeah, I just want to thank you for uh, 
giving us opportunity to you know share what we got going on here. So thanks. No problem. Thank you, Jesse, for participating and sharing all the great work you guys are doing down there. Um, and I, I think it's great that you return back to the tribe to, to bring with it all the expertise that you've got. Um, now I'll pass along to Dr. Mary Ann Sayer. Hi, my name's Mary Ann Sayer. I um, am a plant physiologist and I work for the U.S. Forest Service Southern Research Station in Pineville, Louisiana. My uh, career is I've actually 30 years here with the Forest Service and I started out working on loblolly pine kind of um, applied silviculture and the physiology that supports applied silviculture for, for pine production in plantations. But about 10 years into my career, uh, got really interested in longleaf pine and that kind of fell in place with the uh, restoration movement for longleaf pine ecosystems. So I now work primarily on longleaf pine and trying to understand and solve some of the problems that we have with longleaf pine so that we can do a better job of getting it back on the landscape. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Marianne. Um, now in the interest of time, anyone else on the call that hasn't had the opportunity to introduce themselves, um, feel free to throw your name, your title, um, where you're from into the chat here in the Zoom session. Um, and I'll get going here with the agenda. Uh, this is the loyalty card checklist document. I uh, touched on this on in the other webinars. Uh, if you're wondering how to navigate this, um, you get a chance to earn one of the three uh, lovely incentive packages that we've put together. Uh, if you can check off some of these tasks in writing reflections. Um, I've referenced the kind of whole process in webinars one and two. Those are posted on the YouTube page. So you can reference back to those to get a better idea. Um, but the gist of it is that each task or writing reflection that you check off moves you a step closer to earning one of those incentive packages. Um, and I have a copy of everybody's uh, incentive checklist here in my records so that I can check off each task or writing reflection as you complete them. Um, you all have access to a copy of this. And if you can't get a hold of one, um, feel free to shoot me an email and I can get one over to you as soon as possible. At each webinar, you all get two opportunities to check off the first task, which is just sharing a reflection with the group. Um, I call for these at the beginning and at the end of each webinar. Uh, any reflection will do. It doesn't necessarily need to be um, about this particular webinar. It could be about a webinar in the past of the series. It could be about one of the virtual site visits that we shared, um, or it might just be an update of a project that you're working on. Um, I encourage you to share these reflections. I think it's gonna help build community of practice here for the forest and wetland staff across the USEP membership. Um, and beyond. And so I, I encourage you to do that. For this specific webinar, there are three writing reflections that you could type up and send to me at teveretusetting.org. Uh, so let's get a little closer look at these. The first of those three reflections is simply emailing your response to how you would finish the sentence. One thing I learned from today's webinar was uh, it doesn't need to be very in-depth. It can be a short and sweet statement about what you learned today. Number two is the, in the is a, a full prompt in the film site visit extended cut from the, from the fire, a legacy of long leaf. Uh, Jesse Bullock and Sean Benedict talk about fire suppression completely changing the range of long leaf. Is fire suppression a concern in your community? Is there a goal of reintroducing fire to the landscape for your community? And then the third is in Dr. Mary Ann Sayers presentation, climate concerns in the Southeast slash South Central for longleaf pine. She speaks to the suitability of longleaf pine in the region under certain climate projections. Are there species of concern for your community where climate change considerations need to be a part of your planning process? And so all three of those reflections, if you uh, get a chance to do those, you can type them up and send them to me. 
Uh, and then here's a quick look at today's agenda. I'm wrapping up the uh, introduction right now. And after this, we're gonna view a, a video uh, on some of the work that's being done in longleaf pine restoration with the Alabama Cushata tribe. And we'll move on to Dr. Mary Ann Sayers presentation and then uh, wrap up with uh, Jesse Bullock's presentation. And then both Jesse and Marianne will sit on a panel and anyone that has questions for them about their presentations can share them then. Uh, and then I have some questions uh, for them as well. Then we'll do a, a quick writing reflection exercise at the end, um, take some time to write those reflections up and then we'll close out uh, and adjourn today's webinar. So I'm going to share the video now. And what we found is that for the best viewing uh, of videos shared through Zoom, if everyone can shut their camera off uh, and mute their mic, um, that will help make sure everybody gets a nice smooth uh, feedback of the video. And so I'm gonna do the same now. I'm gonna Just a second here. A lot of what we know has been handed down from A lot of what we know has been handed down from generation to generation, families to families. And we face a crisis when we lose an elder because there's stories and history that is no longer available. It's important for us to invest our time and our effort to talk to these elders and gather these stories, gather this information because a lot of it is not written in books. We wouldn't know how to use a longleaf if that information has never brought down to us. And so we still teach our younger generations about these things. I teach my kids uh, what uh, these uh, things are important to us. They know how to come out and harvest pine needles and they know how to weave baskets. So, you know, it's very important that we move that tradition down because once we lose that information, we lose part of our culture. And the same thing happens to the species. If we lose that species, it's no longer part of our culture. The longleaf pine has been a part of our culture for many centuries. It's a very important species to our people. We would use the trees to make our cabins. We would use the needles to make our baskets. This is gonna be a lid for this one here once it's completed. But when I was a younger kid, um, I basically was the gopher to go and pick up the pine needles, pick up all the raffia and stuff. I used to think of it as work back then, but growing up over those years, uh, it came back to me after, uh, once I got a little bit older and became an adult, and uh, I started kind of messing with baskets, and then she had a class that I took, and a lifetime of basket making, I'm, I'm sure her baskets are all over the country. Um, Joyce is, is one of the best at it, um, and I, I'm always wanted to follow in her footsteps and, and uh, become the basket maker that she is today. The weaving is all right here. Everything that uh, that goes on in here, it goes in here. You wrap it up. When the baskets are being made, the weaver only does it when he or she is in happy spirits. They are taught not to make baskets when they're feeling sad, when they're not feeling well, or when they're suffering. 
so when they make the baskets, they're putting happy thoughts into it. They're, ha they're in a happy mood. They are content. And when you see a basket and you open it up and everybody always sniffs inside to smell the, sm uh, the pine, you look in there, there's nothing in there except you can see the weaving. But it's not empty. The basket is full of love. It's full of happiness. And that's something that needs to be understood. And so while you're out picking uh, pine needles, it's important to, uh, to have those thoughts. Because you're out here in nature, you're away from a lot of obligations or demands. And in this moment, you can feel peace. You can hear the cars going by, but you hear more of the birds. You can hear that wind coming through. You can hear uh, the ancestors talking to you as you're going through these woods, through those winds. We begin uh, each harvest with a prayer uh, unto the Creator for giving us uh, these pine needles. We've been born with these. We've been uh, taught with these. It's made us who we are because without these lonely pine trees, we would not be here as a tribe today. In my family, we're always taught that longleaf is a significant plant that has shown our people their way in life. Pine trees provided us a great many resources. And as our people were moving um, and feeling pressure from moving from their homelands, when they started traveling, they kept traveling until they continued finding places that still had the pine trees to guide them. You know, our original homelands were back in the Alabama region. When we migrated westward to you know Louisiana and then into Texas, we um, kind of chose you know this area, eastern Texas, you know, with the longleaf as a place to settle. You know, these areas where they mimic, they resemble you know the ancestral homelands. Before European footprint on this continent, there were 190 million acres of longleaf pine in southeastern United States. In the year 2000, we had, uh, did research and learned that there were only 3 million acres of longleaf pine in its former domain. There's field notes, there's history plotting, all those kind of things that used to document longleaf on all these areas, and it was one of the most dominant species. So again, millions of acreage, just nothing but longleaf. And then over time with between logging and harvesting and cutting timber, cutting timber, until we got into the situation where it's literally less than 5% of the population across this whole area. It uh, takes a long time for it to grow. It takes uh, about uh, 25 years to mature. And because it takes so long, uh, a lot of timber uh, owners and operators uh, weren't very happy with that duration. So they would replace the longleaf uh, plantations with uh, shortleaf and loblolly, which grows five to 10 years. And so they get uh, better merchantable timber that way than to wait 25 years for a longleaf. Longleaf went as a undervalued resource for so long. Like People thought you could just harvest it as quickly as you could and that it would rebound like some other tree species do, but instead they kept managing and managing it until the species was pretty much wiped out. And certainly can't talk about longleaf without talking about fire. So fire suppression or removing fire from the landscape has attributed to the loss of this habitat that needs fire to exist. I'm Sean Benedict, the East Texas Forest Preserves Manager here for the Nature Conservancy in Silsby, Texas. IPBN, or Indigenous Peoples Burning Network, is a, is a mechanism to, uh, to help fund training and support and work in partnership to get fire back on the ground. They gave us money to buy PPE, hand tools, and in turn, Sean and the Texas chapter had to come and burn with us so many times and, and in turn we had to go and help him burn. I think our program really took off after that. For a long time I was a one-man show and you know now I got to hire a, a whole crew so with multiple positions and you know that's going to keep the management in this area where we got some good work already, good work established to continue that good work. You know, these ecosystems need fire to, 
to maintain themselves, to, to look open like this. Traditionally, historically, Longleaf Pines were open park-like savannas. So a frequent fire, you know, kept it that way. And with the urbanization of different areas, these, uh, these areas that were once longleaf savannas are now becoming fire suppressed and you know, fire is not really prevalent in those areas anymore. We can use prescribed burning, uh, controlled burning. To, you know, it'll be beneficial to you know, the whole landscape. For our people, we use fire as a tool to clear the brush, keep trails open, trade routes open. We use it as a hunting technique. We used it to keep the woods healthy, just maintain a healthy ecosystem in the area where you're living. Taking a lot of that, applying it to what we're doing today, we want to make sure that these longleaf pines are stimulated, make sure they have some good growth. I personally wanted to bring this resource back to the tribe, make it readily accessible, I and mean, then take advantage of you know, the longleaf that is here. The Nature Conservancy owns and manages almost 6,000 acres of longleaf pine at the Roy E. Larson Sandyland Sanctuary in Silsby, Texas. I've worked here for 15 years, so this is really not only my job, but really my lifestyle. This is kind of my backyard. I've done this work and seen these management units change and improve over time. Longleaf is, is my life, for sure. This is the native landscape. This is truly what East Texas is supposed to look like out here. We really use the three best tools, you know, uh, fire, uh, mechanical work, so thinning work, um, and, and some chemical work. Uh, we're really kind of going after small diameter hardwood, certainly non-native species, some of that invasive species work and exotic removal, uh, mainly with chemical application and then throughout the stands really uh, going in there with, uh, with chainsaws and doing that mechanical thinning, so loblolly removal um, within a longleaf stand. I call it uh, liberating longleaf, going out there finding a longleaf, reducing competition, giving that tree the surviving, fighting chance to take its kind of rightful place within the stand. People don't normally think of a tree as a threatened species. Usually folks are thinking of a snake or a bird. This species having 3% or so remaining of what once was, yeah, just as important to bring back in the system for generations to see and experience. The Nature Conservancy, the Alabama Cachada, federal partners, all of us working together to, uh, to bring this species back with an ambitious goal of 8 million acres by 2025. Really, every acre counts for Longleaf. The tribe has roughly uh, over 400 acres of uh, longleaf pines. These pines behind us were planted in 2012. The planting of it started in, back in 2010. Locally here, we're doing a lot of good management. We've gone in, we've done mechanical treatments, we've done a uh, couple of burns in this unit already, and we're just gonna continue that. We can continue to bring the longleaf back to where it needs to be. the species as a whole had a population that was surely dwindling to the point where it was almost getting close to not being out in the wild that people could find. And you had artisans, people that carry on the medicinal knowledges, not being able to have access to these trees. They'd have to travel hours and hours away, and now they can travel literally five minutes, less than that, probably down the road from their homes to find this plantation. and. It's a beautiful thing because, again, you're bringing back resources that were here already and restoring it so that it can continue to grow and flourish here, which connects it again to home. Uh, and to me, home is a greater sense of place. Like our people are taught that this is the area that we were led to, this is where we're meant to protect and take care of. And this allows us to bring this resource back for us to be an active partner, active role in managing, caring for, and continuing to foster the species to the future.
this group that's out here today and seeing them actually harvest and doing activities that for a while there were almost lost um, is just a beautiful thing. You have a different diverse individuals out here all contributing to helping the native home culture right now maintain those traditions, carry their culture forward, carry on that knowledge and preserving it. Um, I think that's just awesome. And seeing the young people out here who earlier might have said they hadn't done this before, well now they have that same passion and drive that they can teach their families. These programs, not only are they, it's, it's conservation of the longleaf itself, it's preservation of, of the culture. Uh, because if we didn't have anywhere to pick harvest pine needles, you know, it might make it a little bit harder and folks may not be as interested as somewhere being closer to us. And then for access purposes, you know, we can drive right up to the, to the area that's been planted and we can uh, harvest, you know, right from the truck and we don't have to face the hardships. We are definitely appreciative of that. Basket making has opened opportunities for us to travel to different places and be able to express our culture and, and share it. And uh, just, I mean, baskets have taken me to all kinds of different places. Being handed down from my grandmother on down to here up to now. So I have uh, three grandsons and one daughter. They haven't picked up any on my uh, culture. They don't have the patience. And Elliot, he picked up on, from handing it down from his grandmother on down to now. And he's got children too. Who's going to take up after him is the question that later on in the year. Yeah, I mean, that's how it's basically been passed down from generation to generation. When you're talking about longleaf pine, of course you're talking about revitalizing that species to still be here for future generations. You want them to have the same strength in our customs, our traditions that our previous generations, our ancestors had. With my position, I've learned to adapt more of a conservation look at things, conserving the resources so that future generations can still learn from, benefit from those resources. And so balancing conservation and preservation it really helps us to carry on our culture, carry on the ecological knowledge of the resources and how beneficial they are to all of us. That's a, it's a great video. I uh, see so many connections between being so tied to brown ash baskets and here in the Northeast, all the way to the Lake States that um, it's really, really cool to watch a different cultural resource that's used for baskets um, and all the work that's being done to protect it. Um, it's so cool to see uh, a spot so close to the reservation where people can get access to that culture resource. Um, that's always stuck out to me in those that video and in the, the TNC video. So special thanks to uh, TNC, the Alabama Cushata tribe, Brian Celestine and Jesse Bullock in those videos and all that are featured. I think it really makes for an awesome video and we'll have that to share in future events as well. Um, so, uh, we don't, we'll hold off on any questions about the video. Jesse would be the one to field stuff about that. Um, and we'll move along to uh, Dr. Marianne Sayers presentation. Um, you wanna check your screen sharing ability, Marianne? Let's see. I'm not quite sure 
I see my screen on the one side. I wonder if I should escape and try to, to reestablish. Whichever um, screen has the Zoom window on it, Marianne, there should be a, a spot at the bottom of the screen for so share, screen screen. share. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Okay. That's the screen. Do you see that? It's uh, still loading. Perfect. Yes, we see your first okay. slide. Okay, great. Okay, well, I'll, I'll begin whenever you're ready then. Yeah, um, okay. so this is uh, Dr. Mary Ann Sayers. She's gonna present on climate concerns in the Southeast and South Central US for Longleaf Pine. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Well, Mary Ann. I'm really happy to be here and I really enjoyed that video. It, it's really um, kind of emotional. But mm. um, anyway, I've spent a long time working on Longleaf Pine. But I am a plant physiologist. I'm a research scientist with the US Forest Service. I'm located in Pineville, Louisiana, which is just not very far at all from, from where we actually saw that video take place. Let's see. Oops, there we go. What I thought I would do is begin by telling you a little bit about uh, where I work. This will kind of set the stage for how I've uh, outlined the presentation. As I mentioned, I work for the Southern Research Station and the Southern Research Station is located throughout the Southeastern United States, as you can see on this map. In the Southern Research Station, there are four research centers and each of those have several research work units that work on various um, you know, problem areas of forestry in the South. I work for the Forest Restoration and Management Research Center in one of the research work units that is dedicated basically to restoring and managing longleaf pine ecosystems. We have three locations uh, throughout the South um, and they're noted by the black dots in this map. And then we also have two experimental forests, one in Louisiana and one in Alabama that we're responsible for. My unit, myself and the others in it are basically responsible for addressing all things longleaf. If there's a problem with longleaf pine, we like to think that we can, we can address it. These are some of the areas that we're working on now. And if there's another problem, it could be on our to-do list or maybe it needs to be placed on our to-do list, but we do focus on longleaf pine. It's really important, I think, to, to look at climate change and longleaf pine for a lot of reasons. But uh, one of them is that there's been a tremendous effort uh, put forth recently to restore these ecosystems that have been cut over. Um, we now have the range-wide conservation plan for longleaf pine, which is a very successful and energized restoration effort. It's made up of federal, state, and private partners. They're organized, they have very specific goals, and they have funding, and they are um, really accountable for that funding. They put together a, a annual accomplishment report. And in that accomplishment report, you can see that they are doing a great job putting Longleaf back on the landscape. One thing that they do uh, in this organization is they have wonderful landowner outreach. So um, it's a really good go-to place for uh, companies or private landowners or, or agencies, entities interested in, in working on getting longleaf put back on the landscape. I view the problem of longleaf pine and climate change at two scales. As a plant physiologist, I see that there are individual aspects of longleaf pine that are going to interact with climate change. So this would be individual seedlings, saplings, and trees and how they respond to aspects of climate change. But then we also have to think about longleaf pine as just one of many species in the, in the ecosystems of longleaf pine. It's a keystone species, which makes it very important. It's stuff like the ecosystem doesn't survive without that keystone species. So I've looked at both of these scales, um, the individual scale, longleaf pine, from what I've read and found out is going to be uh, doing fairly well, could do fairly well in a, in a change in climate as an individual. But when you look at longleaf pine as one component of the longleaf pine ecosystems, there may be some challenges. So that's what I wanna focus on for the remainder of the presentation. 
The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has summarized what we might expect with climate change in North America. And they predict that there will be continued air, te air temperature increases. And we've already seen uh, quite a bit of, of, of uh, warming going on. We're now about a degree and a half on average globally uh, of an increase in, in air temperature. Uh, for North America also, there's predicted to be an increase in annual amounts of rainfall, but we expect the rainfall to occur in fewer rainfall events. So they're gonna be larger events, but fewer of them. So it's gonna be kind of a feast or famine situation for water. Um, there's a prediction for an increase in tropical cyclones or hurricanes, and also an increase in severe storm events. And I think we've all seen that in Louisiana, Texas area with the increase in hurricane activity over the last five years or so and tornadoes as well. There's also uh, predicted to be an increase in, in drought um, in, 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 the, in North America. And all of these are going to affect longleaf pine um, in one way or another. So what I'd like to do is first talk about longleaf pine as the individual. Um, I've got three examples of how longleaf pine might fare compared to the other major southern pine species with, with a change in climate. The first example I want to show you is for air temperature. And I've pulled some figures from uh, published scientific literature to demonstrate um, these examples. And this slide shows um, information from small pieces of information from three individual studies. These studies were each much larger than just what I'm showing you, but it will give you an idea of what to expect. On the left, this is work done by Nedlow and others, um, longleaf pine, or love lolly pine grown in a greenhouse in pot seedlings, lots of them. And they, they looked at uh, seedling loblolly responses to a lot of different variables. And as far as temperature goes, they found that photosynthesis rates in the foliage of these seedlings, that would be another uh, term for that would be Amax on, on the, um, the axis here, the Y axis. Amax declined as air temperature increased once it reached a certain point, and that was about 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And after that, as temperature increased, it got hotter, those seedlings started to shut down uh, and were no longer photosynthesizing at, at very high rates. The same thing was found in the middle panel by Tang and others. This is for plantation loblolly pine. This was actually on our experimental forest here near, near um, Pineville, Louisiana. Uh, they found that plantation loblolly pine photosynthesis also, once it reached an, an air temperature, it was in an environment where the air temperature got to about 86, you know, the upper 80s and started to increase uh, all the way to 104 degrees Fahrenheit, there was a pretty, uh, there's the decline for, uh, there was a decline in these plantation loblolly pine photosynthesis rates. So this is what we see for loblolly pine. And this is what, as we saw in the video, longleaf pine was cut over and replaced with other species, loblolly being one of them. And this is what we see with loblolly pine, which is now our major pine out there. So. Um, we don't see this with longleaf pine, although it can't, it, it, it might decline a little bit in photosynthesis if, if air temperature gets super hot, like 104, that's pretty darn hot, but uh, you don't see this drastic uh, decline in photosynthesis rates. And this is something we observed in uh, one of the studies that we did uh, with planted longleaf pine seedlings that had grown into saplings on the far right. Um, in this experiment, this was done um, in central Louisiana, Louisiana on the wind district of the Kasachi National Forest. And we had an experiment where we were looking at prescribed fire and how uh, prescribed fire affects the physiology of longleaf pine. Uh, the, the figure shows um, uh, two treatments, a control treatment, which is an unburned treatment in blue. And then the red bar represents a uh, prescribed fire treatment, which was burning in the fall before these measurements were taken. Um, the, two, for the first two bars are morning measurements and the second two bars are afternoon measurements. And the first thing you can notice here is that 
the afternoon measurements are just about as high as the morning measurements, which is something we don't see for loblolly pine. Longleaf pine was able to maintain fairly high gas exchange rates in the afternoon. That's when it gets really super hot too. And we also saw that longleaf pine was able to maintain these pretty good rates of photosynthesis, even though air temperatures in the summer, in the afternoon, June, July, and August, when the measurements were taken, were 96, 95, and 102 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's when we took the measurements, that's high air temperatures, and longleaf pine still maintains pretty good gas exchange or photosynthesis rates. Remember, you can't have carbon fixation, growth, and survival unless you have photosynthesis. So this is important. The second example I wanna show you is for water deficit um, and comparing the three, three main uh, Southern pine species, longleaf, loblolly, and slash pine. We know that longleaf pine is naturally distributed on dry forest soils. And, and the best example I know of this is when you think about the sand hills of Georgia and North Carolina, those are deep sands. They are soils that are called sand and they uh, can go 15 feet or deeper with sand. And longleaf pine is the only pine really that can grow on those soils. The other pines can't tolerate that. Uh, we also know that longleaf pine is the most drought tolerant of the Southern pines. Um, and one of the ways that longleaf pine is able to do this is, is it, in the way it develops its root system. It has a very deep and extensive root system. Um, the, the figure uh, on the right showing one of our staff members, he's standing next to the root system of a 12 year old longleaf pine that was excavated. And you can see the amount of energy that this young individual has sunk into the root system, but not just the roots, into that tap root. And that tap root drives down deep and is able to access water that's deep in the soil profile. So in addition to a deep taproot, longleaf pine can also develop an extensive root system as soil quality declines. So as it gets drier and less, um, less fertile, longleaf pine can shift its carbon allocation pattern. All the pines do this, but longleaf pine does it really, really well. Um, and, it, and it allocates a larger amount of carbon to the root system. So you get what we call a higher root to shoot ratio. So the dry mass of the root system re related to the shoot is higher for longleaf pine, especially on these, on these dry soils. Kind of think of it as being a bottom heavy approach to, um, to tree development. And this, this root system, this high root to shoot ratio really helps the um, hydraulic efficiency of longleaf pine. They can have a very high hydraulic efficiency. And all basically that term means is that they are very good at water uptake and transport compared to the other southern pines. And uh, this, uh, the, the, the figure I'm showing here is from a paper uh, and study done by Samuelson and others, 50 year old slash pine, loblolly pine and longleaf pine compared. Uh, and the, um, the white bars represent loblolly pine, slashed or hatched bars represent slash pine, the black bars are for longleaf pine. And what you can see here is the, the variable, the response variable here is needle water potential. So less negative needle water potentials are good. And you could see that longleaf pine is able to maintain less negative needle water potentials compared to the other two pine species, which is really giving longleaf pine a winning edge. They really are able to, to pump water for longer periods of time during the day and more water compared to the other species. So I think it would be fair to say that when it's dry, longleaf pine maintains its water supply for photosynthesis longer than the other two species. Now, for example, three, this is looking at longleaf pine and loblolly pine um, in response to high wind events. And these two pictures were taken after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. On the left is loblolly pine, on the right is uh, longleaf pine. 
Loblolly pine tends to snap in high wind. So the trees are definitely dead uh, in that situation. What they observed uh, with, with um, longleaf pine was that some trees do snap, but a lot of trees uproot or they, they we call it clay rooting or toppling. That, that's good because there's an opportunity for salvage for one thing, but not all of the trees, very, uh, a lot fewer trees die or, or are destroyed by these high wind events when there's longleaf in the stand versus loblolly in the stand. And this uh, figure here shows you a comparison of the three species uh, in, a, in the 50 year old study that I showed in the, in the previous panel. And you can see that longleaf pine has less mortality after Hurricane Katrina compared to loblolly pine. So mature longleaf pine is more tolerant of these high wind events than loblolly pine. Not to say that longleaf pine doesn't have its limits. We saw this very clearly uh, in 2020 after Hurricane Laura. This is the Vernon Ranger District, a shot over, I think a drone shot uh, after Hurricane Laura. And you can see the destruction that took place in this beautiful longleaf pine stand. So I think the, her, the her Laura was still a category one when it went over this area. So longleaf pine is strong, but it does have its limits. And that's important to remember. The Climate Change Atlas is a tool that it was produced by the Forest Service. It utilizes forest inventory and analysis data. That is data collected year after year after year on, on permanent plots across the Southeast. And um, they use this data and they, to, to um, estimate the distribution of tree species. And then they applied um, the distribution and ran it through a couple of climate change scenarios to get future distributions of these tree species. On the left are the two panels shown for loblolly and longleaf pine. And this is the current distribution of these species. The color represents an importance value. So the bluer the color, that would represent the more uh, prevalent that species is on the landscape, its importance level. After running the um, distribution through the climate uh, model, they found some very interesting things for loblolly and longleaf pine. Uh, first of all, loblolly pine migrates northward. You can see that very clearly. Uh, of course, with warming, uh, maybe uh, less severe weather events, our pines can move, move a little bit further north. They found that lo loblolly pine was a very good infill species. So where species fell out, maybe in the southern part of the range because of temperature or drought, whatever, uh, as climate change advances, um, long maybe, maybe loblolly pine would fall out other species would move in, but longleaf loblolly pine could move in uh, a little bit further north where other species fell out. Loblolly pine has some problems though. It has problems with shade because it's a shade intolerant species. It has to have full sunlight uh, uh, to, to, to do well. It also is gonna develop some insect pest problems and some drought problems as climate change advances. Looking at longleaf pine, um, they found that it predicted that longleaf pine would remain in its current range. It would, it would, it would become, it would spread out a little bit more within its current range and it would migrate a little bit north. They also felt like they predicted that it would be a good viable infill species. So maybe where loblolly pine would fall out because of drought or because of storms or temperature, longleaf pine would be there waiting to move in. Longleaf pine has fewer problems than loblolly pine. Its main problem though is gonna be competing vegetation and that shade that, that, that vegetation causes, especially during the grass stage. Longleaf pine, just like loblolly is shade intolerant. So it has to have a lot of sunlight to grow and survive well. All in all, longleaf pine actually did have a higher adaptability score than loblolly pine. So that's interesting. It seems like longleaf pine as an individual uh, may do fairly well in the future with um, climate change taking place. But shade is going to be a challenge in the future. 
And this is for, for many reasons, but two of them are, are here. Repeated prescribed fire as an, is, is an essential tool uh, to control vegetative competition in longleaf pine. And we saw that in the video, fire is very important tool to manage these forests. Um, and it's also cost effective and it's doable. Uh, but with climate change, uh, there are gonna be a, some interferences with the use of fire. And so we need to be prepared to deal with that. Now we know we can, uh, we can grow longleaf pine in the absence of fire, like in a plantation setting, as long as you can control vegetative competition. But as an ecosystem, repeated fire does perpetuate these ecosystems. It keeps them naturally open. And with that openness, sunlight is able to reach the forest floor. Um, this allows the natural regeneration to take place because they need full sunlight. So you get natural regeneration in the gaps and open areas. You also get the sunlight on the forest floor creates a ground layer of herbaceous plants and grasses. And this is where the, this provides the fuel for the low intensity uniform fires that perpetuate the ecosystem. The ground layer also provides forage and cover for wildlife. Um, and then the flowering plants in the ground layer, they attract pollinators that are also a food source for some of the animals in the ecosystem. There are economically important plants in these ecosystems and they are the home for lots of game species and lots of threatened and endangered species. The Southern Forest Futures Project was another project done by the Forest Service. It was published by the Southern Research Station in 2013. And um, this effort took the forest inventory and analysis data, the, the permanent plot data that I talked about before, and, um, and put it into the US Forest Assessment System model. And they uh, designed six hypothetical situations for the future. These were what they called the cornerstone futures that took place between 2010 and 2060. And they included climate change in these cornerstone or hypothetical situations. And in these models then they looked at, at how response variables perform. So there were a lot of response variables and they looked at, at the outputs. And one of the outputs that they were interested in is how fire was gonna perform under these, these six future hypothetical situations. And what they found that's imp important and interesting for longleaf pine is that fire dependent ecosystems they predict are going to be degraded. So this is not good news for longleaf pine ecosystems, but there are some things that can be done uh, to try to address this and, and prevent this from happening. So we talked about the climate change atlas. And so now we see with the Southern Forest Futures Project that there, there is a little bit of question of whether or not we're going to make it to this good future condition for for longleaf pine if we have a problem with um, applying prescribed fire. But I believe that there are solutions to this. Now, there are a lot of things and aspects of longleaf pine ecosystems that can be affected by climate change. And I, we just have, that could go on for days. But there's one I really wanna talk about because this is something we've seen in our research. I've done you know 20 years or so of longleaf pine research, a lot of prescribed fire research, and we saw something that I am concerned about, and that is applying prescribed fire that is technically in prescription. So you, you are technically in prescription. We did this in twice. We had this happen where we were surprised because we had, in one situation, we had a lot of crown scorch and a, and a growth decline. And then in another situation, we had a growth decline. And I want to talk about this because I think it's important when it comes to climate change. In situation one, we had a, we burned in May. Um, this is a, an experimental plot, and it was burned in May, but it was burned at a time um, be, in the like we had, we went. Let me use my pointer. We went through April, and we were under. We had water deficit. We had a little bit of rain, 
enough to get us in prescription and we needed to burn in May. That was what I said I wanted to do. So we burned in May because we were in pres prescription technically, but then we were out of prescription because we were faced then with another six weeks of, of water deficit. We were in a mild drought during this period, April through June. When we burned, we had about 80 to 90% crown scorch and we didn't like that. That's not what we had wanted to do. I didn't think that the trees were gonna be that badly affected because I know that May is the best time to burn. They're physiologically set up to regrow their leaf area and not have a growth, a negative growth effect. But because of the crown scorch level in these individuals and the fact that photosynthesis was not stopped, but it was lower than normal, I think we were not able to produce the carbon to regrow leaf area and so we were affected by this drought that we weren't expecting. The second example is similar. This was also a study. This was a graduate student study. You know, graduate students go to school for two or three years. They have a very finite period in which they can do their studies. We needed a May burn. This was on the wind district of the Kasachi uh, in co cooperation with Louisiana Tech University. Graduate student needed to have a May burn we were already in a severe drought, but we had some rain and we didn't know it was going to continue to be a severe drought. We thought we were, oh, we were, we were scot free now. We were going to have rain and everything was good. So we were in prescription in quotes. We burned, we only had 60% crown scorch, but um, had pretty big growth loss. We didn't know that we were going to have three or four more months of severe drought after that. So in both of these situations, we were in, we were in prescription, but we had other conditions that prevented the foliage from being regrown so that these trees could, you know, not ever take a growth hit. So I think that there's a place to be concerned about in, in overlap between, you know, you need to burn in prescription, but I wouldn't want to be too desperate about that because that's what we were. We were in, quote unquote in prescription, but there was overlap between being in prescription and conditions that reduced foliage recovery and climate change could do the same thing. So I know this is a problem, but I think there are solutions that, that, that can be considered. One would be to start thinking about a more conservative, uh, more conservative prescription. So, maybe qualifying prescriptions or, or when you would do your prescribed fire, but then you have to have alternatives to fire. You've got to get back to looking at you know, herbicide use and precision herbicide use and maybe some mechanical means of, of vegetation control to reduce shade. I know it's expensive, but if we work on it, maybe we can come up with some economical options that will be available when we need them as climate change continues. So with that, those are my thoughts and I'd be happy to, to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Say. That was uh, an excellent presentation. I really liked the uh, case study examples that you, sh you offered. And um, you know, I'm thinking about the last portion there where you have in prescription burns, but they have a negative impact on growth. Um, I think it really comes back to the uncertainty that we have when it comes to to climate change and what we might see. And you know, I always think about marshy areas when I see the scientific name palustris. Mm -hmm. That's not really what you think of for longleaf pine, but it does come back to to precipitation and, and moisture, and it does really rely on that. In, in its environment. So it kind of is fitting in a way um, for, the, for the species. But um, yeah, I think we have some time for a, a question if there's any from the group or comments that someone would like to share with um, Dr. Marianne Sayer. If not, um, there will be an opportunity after Jesse presents where Marianne and Jesse will be on a panel and you can ask questions then. But just in case there are, um, now is a great time to, to ask your question to Dr. Marianne. I'll check the chat here. Uh, 
Hey, Dr. Marianne, this is Jesse. Mm -hmm. So when do you think the long leaf um, is tall enough or old enough to not affect the budding, um, you know, when the buds are coming out? Because um, we, we've been kind of toying, kind of experimenting here and there, but, um, you know, some people say one thing and some people say another, but uh, when, when do you think is the right age height we we've um we've done uh, some work uh, we're, we were in, we're working with really young individuals and so what we found is that there is a window of time in which grass stage seedlings will perform quite well you can scorch the foliage off of grass stage seedlings or young you know uh, young saplings that are not very tall as long as you burn during a certain time of the year when they have a lot of carbohydrate reserves available. So these pines, they accumulate carbohydrates in their roots and in their, in their shoots and, and in their stem um, between November and March, pretty much. And by March, they're pretty much full. They've got a, a full component of, of energy. And as long as your fire doesn't kill the buds, the uh, carbohydrate is enough to regrow that leaf area once you do this once the seedlings and saplings are scorched so there's a, there is a definite window um we we say may is kind of ideal but but you also have to be careful if you're if there is a little window within that time if you're working with a candling individual so you have maybe young seedlings that are coming out of the grass stage or saplings that are candling you you don't want to burn unless that first flush that elongating candle is protected by needles so um, where we're at in in central louisiana that could be a concern for like march and early april uh, but once you get past that those buds are protected by that first flush of foliage pretty much from the heat that would, of course, only apply if you had a normal burn with normal temperatures. You couldn't have a conflagration, at, you know, with unchecked full, you know, your fuel loads would have to be normal rather than, you know, excessive. But there is a, there is a time and place to burn those young individuals. It can be done. Thank you. Dr. Sayer. Um what are the, the criteria or the indicators that you use to determine uh, when certain stands need to be burned? Well, there, it's kind of a, a management protocol would be that you it's desirable to burn every two to three years because that's going to generate the fuel. You want to keep that fuel cycle going. So that's what I think that the national forest here shoots for is, you know, trying to burn every two, two to three up to five years and that will generate the fuel and it's the, the undesirable species that are in the, in the ground layer. They're not that big yet that you can't kill them with fire. Um, so one of the one of the problems we have here is volunteer loblolly pine, and that came out in the video. Um, we are bringing longleaf in where we've got a lot of loblolly, and loblolly is kind of like a weed. And I was kind of taught that if loblolly gets to be about four foot tall, Jesse, you might know more about this than I do, but once loblolly gets about four feet tall, you aren't going to have a hard time killing it with fire. Mm -hmm. So you want to do your burning cycle to to maintain that ground layer. And so two to three years is ideal for that. I had another question. Um, <clears throat> as far as the duff and litter layer, are we, do you recommend having some layers there, whether it be duff or litter, just as a uh, insulation for the, the ground, uh, the root systems, and some of the other um, yeah. the other vegetation that the native uh, grasses and all that. Yeah. The the duff layer is it you know it has a lot of different roles. There's two maybe two ways to look at it that you need to consider. So 
reintroducing fire into a system that has not been burned regularly, you're going to have a really thick duff layer and it's going to have a lot of roots in it of the plants, your ground layer plants and your trees. They're going to have a lot of the fine roots are going to be growing in that duff layer. It's very rich in nutrients. Um, you wouldn't want to burn that completely off. So if you were wanting to introduce fire in that situation, you would probably want to, I mean, it might take 30 years to get the stand that you really want. You have to start baby steps with maybe a winter burn and dormant season burns that are a little bit less intense so that you don't really shock the system and kill a lot of the roots and that are growing in that duff layer. Um, on the other hand, once you plant longleaf pine, I, if you're planting in a situation that's been site prepared, I, I, and then maybe uh, site prepared with burning, you, you probably don't have a lot of duff layer there um, to, to worry about. And you can plant in that situation. And I wouldn't worry about burning to the, burning to the ground because the, the, the herbaceous plants, the ground layer plants like our blue stem grasses, they, they seed in naturally. And there's actually a lot of, of that seed is in the seed bank of the soil laying dormant. So if you, if you open up the, the forest floor and have a lot of light coming to it, the, the <clears throat> seeds that are in the soil are going to catch that light and, and with moisture and other as, aspects, you'll get germination and develop that ground layer. Okay. Yeah, I got some slides I'd like, like you to mm -hmm. kind of criticize here, here in a few minutes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we probably need to get together because we're close enough, you know, we could, we could actually visit in person about this sometime. Sure. Awesome. Yeah, I'm loving the, uh, the questions and back and forth dialogue. Um, why don't we uh, switch over now to Jesse and he can share his presentation. <clears throat> So Jesse is the fire management specialist with the Alabama Cushata tribe of Texas. And uh, it's been great to connect with Jesse uh, for this webinar series. I've had a couple different conversations with him on the phone about things beyond just this presentation. So I'm really excited to see his presentation today. Um, so I'll hand it over to you, Jesse. Right now we're seeing your presentation modes. So you might have to switch the display settings, that button there at the top. There you go. Perfect. How about that? Cool. So again, my name is Jesse Bullock. I'm the fire management, spe fire management specialist for the Alabama Cushata Tribe of Texas. We're located in East Texas, roughly an hour north of Houston, um, in the in the vast piney woods of East Texas. So um, the tribe has over 9,000 acres of tribal trust lands. We also have, um, I think it's roughly about 1,300 acres of tribal fee lands that um, does have longleaf on it, um, both trust and fee lands. So um, we do have some acreage to work with. <clears throat> um, as far as the, the tribes, uh, our program, or tribal fire management program, we have uh, Myself as a fire management specialist, um, I have um, nine employees fully funded by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, we, we are a federally recognized tribe, so we do get um, funding from the BIA to uh, manage our fire and fuels management program uh, here at the tribe. also have a uh, admin assistant that's fully funded by the tribe. So um, the tribe and the, the BIA have both um, really been really supportive of our of our program here. And, um, you know, we're, I, I tell people we're still in our infancy and we're still trying to build a program the way we want it, but we're getting there. So, um, so a little bit about this Longleaf, uh, we, um, <clears throat> the tribe partnered with the NRCS 
back in 2010 as um, and they started planning, um, you know, restoring longleaf, planting longleaf here at the reservation. There's pockets of mature longleaf here and there, but nothing like it um, used to be a long time ago. So <clears throat> the tribe, um, with this, the with the longleaf's importance to the tribal people, the tribe wanted longleaf plantations here um, at the reservation. And like I said, they partnered with the USDA NRCS to um, start planting uh, these 400 acres of uh, a longleaf. Um, <clears throat> in 2011, um, you know, East Texas, most of the South, we had a, a bad drought and that postponed um, planting of the longleaf. Uh, planting was supposed to occur in the in the winter, um, January, February of 2011. Um, but, you know, just the outlooks and all that, just things just didn't shape up. Uh, they postponed it to the summertime. Uh, by the summertime, um, <clears throat> you know, it had already been too dry and, you know, this region's been, a, was in a drought for uh, pretty much the whole summer. So they postponed the planting 2000, 2012 and um, they were able to get 400 acres planted on six different tracks. <clears throat> Again, they were both on tribal trust and tribal fee land. So, um, you know, just kind of scattered throughout the uh, tribal lands. As we all know, uh, longleaf management and longleaf pines, uh, the management of it is really, um, it, they need the fairly active managing, uh, whether it be mechanical treatments, whether it be prescribed fire, whether it be uh, herbicides, you know, um, any of those three, uh, early and often they, they need the, the, long, the, the, the management. Um, and, in 2012, again, they were planted. In 2013, they wanted to do a, a control burn, prescribed burn, but you know, upon evaluations of the stands, they, um, the people that were placed here at the time determined that there was not enough fuel on the ground to uh, sustain a, a, a nice prescribed burn over the entire, entire area. Um, same thing with 2014. <clears throat> They went back and looked and the, the fuel was still, um, the fuel loading still wasn't um, able to sustain a, a, a good fire running through the, uh, the, um, the stand. So they put it off to 2015. <clears throat> it Excuse was me, Jesse. Burn. Yes. So, sorry to cut you off. Um, I wasn't sure if you had flipped through any slides yet. I have uh, not. No. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to check to make sure we weren't frozen. Okay. <laughs> Carry um, on. Thank you, Jesse. Back in the 2015, they um, contracted contracted a burn. It was a module of a burn. There still wasn't a whole lot of fuel on the ground, but they went ahead with the burn anyway. It was a good mosaic burn. Um, and back to 2016, 2017, 2018. There was no um, no burning, no herbicides, no mechanical treatments in these areas. So, um, so over the over six seven years, there was only that one prescribed burn, which was marginal at that. So marginal at that. So, um, so in 2018, I like I said I uh, came over from the U.S. Forest Service and I had been on many prescribed burns, worked with some of the longleaf restoration that was going on on the U.S. Forest Service side on, on our uh, district at the time. And so, um, you know, I, I did have some experience with uh, the restoration efforts and what it needed. So um, I was kind of um, appointed the, the point of contact for the longleaf restoration. <clears throat> um, so uh, the video that you've seen, it, it really just told the story of how our tribe uses the longleaf and the longleaf needles. And, um, and it, it's not just the longleaf uh, trees itself, it's the whole ecosystem. There was medicinal uh, plants within the ecosystem. You know, there was the plants um, 
Um, they ate them. Uh, the the um, the um, the animals that uh, roamed those woods. It was just the whole ecosystem as a whole. And um, <clears throat> you know, the video you know kind of demonstrated how we use the ecosystem as a whole, and um, and what it meant to the tribe, its importance to the tribe. Oops, excuse me. So um, this picture kind of um, shows, displays the the vast, um, the vast. Uh, range of the longleaf uh, pines before um, European um, contact with the, the, new, uh, the these areas and like the video said those all these all these states and all these regions supported um, sustained longleaf pine for for centuries and um, and now it's only just a just a fraction of what it was before. So, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the, this is one of the the most ex um, endangered species uh, around, and uh, you know, we're just trying to do our part to um, help out that uh, the restoration of efforts. So this is a, a map of our our reservation. Um, we have all these tribal trust lands shaded in brown. We got um, the National Park Service to the south of us here shaded in blue. We have, um, excuse me, the brown is shaded, uh, the brown shaded is tribal trust lands and these uh, pink shades are tribal fee lands. So we have uh, one, two tracks over here of longleaf, um, I believe this, um, one right here, uh, Midway, I believe that's 74 acres. Just to the south of it, it's 42 acres of a uh, long leaf. Holder one, and that is um, 125 acres. Holder two is 127 acres. We have a little bitty piece of uh, five acres right here. And we have 36 acres. Um, right in here and this is the tribal headquarters and there's homes uh, scattered tribal uh, residences just scattered all through the reservation and um, you can see you know just the uh, vicinity of the the long leaf uh, versus going all the way to uh, Pineville or Fort Polk or you know some of those areas to to pick the long leaf needles um, you know, some some people were, like I said, traveling long distances and paying for the uh, the needles to uh, to make the baskets um, just a few years ago, and now we've um, <clears throat> got this resources here here at our own reservation, and you know a lot of people are taking advantage of it. I have my program, my my crew members, they uh, go out and harvest the needles for uh, the elders to. Um, to continue their uh, their basketry and um, you know just just help out any way they can with that those projects. So um, yeah, I'm really happy to to do this work here at the tribe. <clears throat> so um, I got a few photo points of um, of a couple of stands. Um, this particular stand was. Um, Again, this is what it looked like before um, the picture was taken in 2020, before any of the uh, burning, before any of the mastication took place. So this kind of what I was up against, um, um, you know, the, like the video said, I was a one man show for a few years. And finally in 2021, I was able to get some help to, um, to um, get some funds from the BIA to fund a full program with heavy equipment and all the, the good stuff to, uh, to manage these areas. So um, I'll take you through some slides, some before and after, and uh, just kind of let you guys take a look at some of the projects we've been uh, doing in our Longleaf stand. This is um, September, 2020, pre-broadcast burn, pre-mastication. 
<clears throat> this picture was taken a year later after we went in and burned it and um, went in with mastication. So just a really night and day difference. Um, same photo point, same same everything. Just um, <clears throat> I, I was really happy with the results of this uh, the, this the the entire unit uh, Young Longleaf um, project. Here's a different um, a different photo point. This is pre pre burn pre mastication again September two September two thousand twenty. And this is post burn, post mastication uh, photo taken a year later. So going from that to that. Um, this was an, another photo point, uh, pre burn, pre mastication, again, September 2020. This is a post broadcast burn, but pre mastication taken in uh, October of 2021. And this is the same photo point, post burn, post mastication. So you're looking at a, that to that to that and just a matter of a, a, a year or so. Um, same photo point, just different vantage point, uh, pre-broadcast, pre-mastication. Um, Post-broadcast burn, pre-mastication. And then post-mastication, post-burn. Got a couple more of these. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, September 2020, pre-burn, pre pre-mastication. Uh, post burn, pre mastication, and this is post burn, post mastication. And that's it for that. <clears throat> so, yeah, we uh, we really went in. We were really aggressive with um, our management of these stands. We um, you know, as you can see from the video, uh, the photos, we were up against, you know, brush, uh, the yopons, the beauty berries, the green briars, all that southern rough that's not not very easy to get through. Um, and we, we had a vision to go in and just um, be really aggressive with it, be really aggressive with our burning, um, be really aggressive with our heavy equipment, our mastication and I've got uh, two great operators that are in the woods nonstop. They um, they know what we're uh, wanting to get out of the long leaf. They know um, how to open up the rows. They just having that those those key pieces in place uh, really helped our program or our our management of the long leaf. It really just helped them help the program just take off and. Um, you know, we um, you know, partner with the TNC, we partner with the NRCS, we partnered with U.S. Forest Service, the Park Service, you know, every, all these entities, they, they're wanting to come help us burn. Um, they're wanting the help from us to go, go and help them burn. Um, <clears throat> and it's really opened up some doors as far as um, just having these partners to, 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 to play with. So, um, I do have uh, a story map I did want uh, to share with you guys. This is um, this is for my first full year with our um, our uh, my employees. So I was able to hire them in October 2021. So this is the first full year of um, having having the personnel in place. So. We are a tribal program. We're funded by the BIA and the Alabama Shutter Tribe. Like I said, I, I'm the fire management specialist. I have a admin assistant, two heavy equipment operators, 
a five person fire fuels module, a, a project coordinator, one engine operator. And uh, in the summertime, I'll have uh, college students as um, the temporary employees. So here's a look at our fine fire folks here at the tribe. Um, <clears throat> You know, they are able to go on fire assignments, wildfire assignments. So, um, you know, we do give that as an incentive. If, you know, we do really good on our projects, if we're caught up and if there's an assignment available, um, I'll, I'll, I'll tend to let those guys uh, go from time to time. So in 2022, FY22, we had 19 planned projects um, for target goal of 1,200 acres. 16 of those were completed. Uh, we did surpass our, our target for an amount of uh, uh, 1,417 acres. Um, <clears throat> you know, I was really, really proud of my crew for achieving those uh, targets and uh, um, getting the acres that we, we, we wanted. So in 2019, um, <clears throat> We had a total of 600 acres treated. Of that, eight acres were um, treated in the longleaf area, longleaf tracks by mechanical means, and another eight acres was burned in the longleaf areas. In 2020, 112 acres was completed throughout the reservation. Of that, 22 was um, 22 acres were mechanically treated in the longleaf areas, and 40 acres were burned in the longleaf areas. Uh, 2021, <clears throat> we achieved, accomplished a total of 1,000 acres. Of that, only 56 was um, mechanically treated in the longleaf stands, and 287 acres were burned in the longleaf stands. And so far this year, um, FY22, we burned, um, or we accomplished 1,417 acres. Um, <clears throat> we've mechanically treated 397 acres in the Longleaf sand. So pretty much all of the Longleaf under, under, undertook a um, mechanical treatment this year. And uh, 325 acres were burned and the Longleaf stands this year. So we, like I said, we're making good progress. Um, some pictures of some of the Longleaf we're burning. Here's a Longleaf stand here, um, here, here. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, and it, it's fun seeing the, our, our crew, um, take part in of these in these projects you know they're relatively young younger crews so just seeing them um, open up their eyes to managing the lonely stands and seeing how people take advantage of uh, um, the long leaf that's here um, it, it's really a good feeling when uh, we can uh, open up their eyes like that so <clears throat> Um, like I said, the, the, the program, the personnel do have the opportunity to go out on wildfire assignments. They, they went out on, excuse me, um, here locally on tribal lands, we had eight wildfires for a total of 12 acres or 13 acres. Um, additionally, they went out to the Fort Apache Reservation in Arizona. We gone up to um, Oklahoma to the Anadarko, um, the Southern Plains region. And we've also been up to the uh, Pawnee Agency up there in Oklahoma. So um, <clears throat> the, we, we do participate in um, wildfire suppression and those efforts as well. Um, we have several prevention uh, smoky bear events that we take uh, partake in each year. Uh, just um, and we 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 been doing a good job educating um, not, not only about fire suppression, but also prescribed burning and 
mechanical treatments and what we're trying to accomplish here and in our own woods here at the reservation. Um, like I said, this program is fairly new. So the whole idea of prescribed burning on a large scale is um, <clears throat> something different. Um, you know, the mechanical treatments really going in and opening up uh, the woods. Um, you know, it, it's, it is different for, you know, some of the members to um, the citizens to, um, to get used to, but we're, we're educating them about why we're doing it. And, um, you know, uh, after, you know, they hear about what we're doing they're they're really um, receptive to it and they want to see more of it now. So, which is good. <clears throat> um, with our program, we do a lot of training, um, uh, chainsaw training, the basic fire trainings, um, business management trainings, leadership trainings. And, um, you know, we, we try to provide our personnel with a bunch of training to um, develop their, their careers as well. So, and <clears throat> additionally, we uh, were awarded in 2020 uh, over 13,000 acres to um, of travel and training dollars for the climate resilience program. Um, <clears throat> our program is pretty much the, uh, the pioneers of this program for the tribe. Um, I was able to send eight of my personnel to um, just to um, open up their their um, their minds to this the the climate change and climate adaptation um, ideology and just uh, kind of expose them to uh, you know the the uh, the changings that's the changing as far as climate um within our own communities um i i definitely want to keep them um looking more towards those those um you know that way of thinking and because um whether we plan for it or not it, it's coming climate change and climate climate adaptation um is it's going to be needed here at the tribe and you know, we want to be, you know, leaders in that, in that realm. And uh, I think uh, the guys have been um, really receptive to that, um, those types of ideas as well. So, <clears throat> and we, um, again, you, you guys seen the video. Um, we did a shorter video um, initially with the TNC, the Nature Conservancy, and uh, you know, that was a really, really good, um, just the overview of the program, overview of how the tribe uses longleaf, over, overview of the importance to longleaf, and overview of our, uh, our relationship with the TNC. They did provide uh, some funding initially to, um, when I was a one-man show, to fund some uh, PPE, some hand tools, and all that, and um, I'm really appreciative of our relationship with them, um, we uh, <clears throat> we call on them a lot of times to come and help us with our burning and and vice versa. If they got some projects, they go ahead and uh, uh, give us a call and you know um, request us when they they have projects going on there. So um, another big highlight is the uh, our program. We were nominated and we will be receiving the uh, Big Thicket Association's R.E. Jackson Conservation Award. It's the, um, it's a um, association that recognizes uh, different contributions to uh, conservation throughout the East Texas region. And uh, this year, like I said, we were nominated and we'll be accepting that award on October 8th. So, <clears throat> Um, here in another month or so, we'll be traveling to Beaumont to receive that award, and uh, I'm pretty happy, pretty excited about that, and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, receiving that award. So, um, I think I went over a little bit on my time, but I'll uh, stop sharing, and if you guys have any questions, we'll be happy to 
happy to uh, answer them. Thank you very much, Jesse. That was a great presentation. Excellent overview of what you guys are doing there. And it's really exciting to hear that you're being recognized for the great work that you guys are doing. Congratulations on the, on the award and being nominated. Um, we'll have to share that on the USAT webpage um, once you guys get that award in October. Uh, sure. But yeah, excellent presentation, really great. I um, want to open it up to any questions from the group and then uh, throw both you and Dr. Marianne on a, on a panel. Just we do have, go ahead. Miss Marianne, I, mm -hmm. I would just, I was just curious, you know, you're opening up those young longleaf stands and they, they look like they have, you know, they, they, I think you're introducing the, they had one prescribed burn maybe, and then you came on board. So the woody um, plants, I would expect once you burn and then you do the mastication, that you've got to be on your toes to be ready to spray for um, hardwood and, and shrubs that come up. Is that something that you, you're having to do? <clears throat> so the tribe is, they're not totally against herbiciding herbicides, but um, they've told me to be you know, cautious when using it. So um, <clears throat> I think our, our plan is to have another fire in 23 and, um, and um, you know, just, just reassessing after the burn, if we need to go back and um, mow those areas. Uh, we'll go back and uh, do some mowing in between those rows and uh, just kind of open it up that way. See Casey's got his hand up. Oh, you're muted, Casey. Thank you, Tyler. And thank you, Jesse. And thank you, Mary, for <clears throat> your um presentations it was really amazing. Um, it was really interesting to me. Uh, so uh, just a comment and then a question. Um, so where I'm at up in, up in Mashpee uh, on Cape Cod, we have um, pitch pine forests, um, which are also uh, you know, fire um, dependent ecosystems. And um, our, our tribe recently brought back prescribed burning as well. Uh, well, recent meeting, about 2014 and <laughs> starting to kind of bring that back. And usually um, the burns are are done in the, the spring or fall, I think, but mo in more recent years, there have been some more fall burns. Um, I, I didn't, I worked in our tribe's natural resources, but I didn't have the training to be on a fire, so I couldn't be up close and everything, but um, I, I know that some of the fall burns were um, good. Like we did them usually the, around the first part of November. Um, and uh, the weather during that time anyways is what people call crisp, <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, um, it's, it's damp, but not too damp and fairly sunny, but not very windy um, usually. And I guess just a good time to get a good burn in. Um, that's when it's done. So my question then is I noticed on the burns that you all were doing, Jesse, it looked like if I was reading the slides right, like kind of end of September, first part of October. Uh, and I was just wondering, is there like, what what was the benefit of for you all uh, around burning around that time? Um, uh, that's my question. So we, we had a good window. We, um, <clears throat> we, um, we kind of centered that around a training. We had a training around that time. We had you know, access personnel there. Um, <clears throat> we, um, and we, we had a good window to get some fire through there. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, if, if we didn't have the amount of people with the amount of fuel that was in that stand at the time, um, I think, uh, you know, just having the, that, the, the personnel there was really the, the determining factor there. Um, <clears throat> Usually we we have some stands that we'll have to burn in January, 
February, um, just they're right up against um, uh, a busy highway, a busy U.S. highway. And so with the north winds that we usually get around that time, we'll have to burn those with the north wind to keep them off, keep the smoke off the road. But um, we do have a couple of units that we can burn at any time, any wind uh, direction. So, mm -hmm. um, and that, that, like I said, that the wind uh, smoke management uh, that plays a, a lot with our burning, um, not just in the long leaf, but you know, all, all burns. Um, but like I said, there's, there's areas that we can burn uh, year round. There's areas that we can burn um, with the north winds. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. And I just, um, for Mary, I was wondering if, uh, so one of the things from your presentation I saw is, you know, we talked when there was some burns, uh, prescribed burns done in, in May during drought years. I thought it, um, of another question, that's something in your work, is there, are you finding where there's like maybe some ability for having some flexibility in, in the prescription? Like if you come upon uh, a, a year and it might be May, but it's, it's a drought year, is it, you know, something you could put off for one year and still be within um, uh, prescription a little bit or, or, or have a little bit of wiggle room in kind of going with what's happening year to year? Well, yes, that's, that's true. Um, you can choose to delay. In our situation, in both of those, we were doing experiments and they, you know, we had a lot of people come together and there was research dollars that needed to be done. And we didn't know we were going to have a bad situation. But in hindsight, if this was a, if it wasn't an experiment and it was just a, a landowner, I would say, yes, I would delay, but uh, delay a year, maybe that would be okay. It kind of depends on how much vegetation you have and what your risks are. And I talked about loblolly pine. Uh, getting away from you or some of the hardwood trees getting away from you. So I, I've i seen stands where, and on the Kasachi where they have year after year, they get a, there's a problem. They can't get the, the prescribed burning done on an area or it's too wet or there's a fire stand down or whatever. And you'll see an area and it'll, it'll just start growing up in a thicket. And that's now you're backtracking so you you can delay but you don't want to delay too long you know mm. that's why i think it's important to start thinking about alternatives as with climate change you know with drier conditions possibly and higher air temperatures you're going to have fuel moistures that are going to be more challenging kind of have to have something else in your toolbox besides fire mm. because you're going to be faced with those delays mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. See your hand up, Anne. Would you like to ask your question to the presenters? Hi, uh, yes, first of all, Jesse, I wanna congratulate you on your program. That's fantastic that you know, you're able to provide employment and educational opportunities for tribal members and to get the young folks involved, that's, that's just phenomenal. So I congratulate you on that. Um, my question um, is for you or Dr. Sayer, uh, here in the area where I am, we have a lot of issues with bark beetle in the pines. And I was wondering if you're seeing any issues with that in your particular stand uh, and management areas. Currently here in East Texas, we are not experiencing, um, obviously there's going to be isolated cases um, all the time, but um, as far as a widespread um, inf in invasion, there's not a whole lot of that going on right now. Um, there, you know, that can change, you know, rapidly, but um, I think what, um, what we're seeing is, you know, we're, some of that, uh, the management that we're undertaking, you know, I can't harp on that enough to our tribal leadership that we need to do more um, burning, more mastication, more uh, thinning, some doing some logging to really open the wood, open up the woods to uh, 
to limit the the, the beetle infestation in, invasion. So, um, like I said, the tribal leaderships they've been um, really taking that good uh, good stance as far as pro providing support to our program, and you know they're they're getting on board with what we want to do here. So, I I would say um, that. I think fire, um, applying prescribed fire in an area is probably not gonna, you know, it's not going in our area, it's not gonna really, you're not gonna in introduce beetle problems. And we, we've had beetle problems before, but it's usually when, you, when you've got a physiological stress on the trees, like in our area, one of the worries we have, like on the Homochitta National Forest in Mississippi was overstocking. So you've got overstocked trees that are, and this was loblolly pine mostly, but overstocked trees that are undergoing physiological stress. So they're susceptible to pine beetles. For our um, burn stands, loblolly or longleaf pine, I don't think that it, fire is, is, is a positive thing. It's not, it's not going to be a bad thing unless it is somehow involved in physiological stress which in my two examples of our studies that did the unex, unexcept, un, unexpected, that would probably uh, be considered physiological stress. And if it went on for too long, of course they'd have to be much older, but if that condition went on for very much longer, then we would maybe be set up for, for insect pests. But I don't think fire is, is going to be the cause of something like that under normal good burning conditions. And, you know, that's in our area, um, up until recent years, uh, prescribed and control burns, they were, people kind of frowned upon them. But now I think they're realizing from a management perspective that, you know, it really needs to be done. And we're, we're dealing with mountain situations uh, more so. And, uh, a lot of the issues that we see is we've got development. You'll have these open areas of forest, and then you'll have development. So it makes it a difficult situation, you know, to do these burns, uh, you know, for the potential of them getting out of control. And I mean, you, you know, it, the best plans can go wrong. But, um, and I think you're, you're absolutely correct that, uh, you know, if we could do more burning, uh, you know, whether, whether it's an actual control burn or whether it's a natural burn that can just allow to, you know, run its course. Uh, but I, I agree. I think, you know, for the most part, because we've dealt with, you know, the bark beetles, gypsy moths, and, you know, we've had little, you know, emerald ash borer as well, get, you know, getting in here. But, um, you know, I was just curious, you know, as far as the long leaves go, if, if they're a little bit more resistant, or if you had just have the same issues if there was no management in place? Um, longleaf is considered to be most resistant to insects and pests among the southern pines. It has a, a good defense system. Uh, resin, you know, the, for the beetles, the resin, you know, that that ex exudes the, the insect is, is something that comes to mind. Um, I don't know, I don't know what else to, where else to go with that. Jesse, do you have anything? You... I don't, I just think um, if there's more active management, then, you know, I think uh, that will kind of minimize the, uh, the ability for the any of those pests to be yeah. brought in. <clears throat> Thank you, Anne, for the question. Thank you, uh, Marianne and Jesse, for answering all those great questions and the great dialogue today. It's, it's been a, a really great webinar. Um, just got some slides here to, to wrap up. Um, and just want to remind everybody that I'll be Oh, I'm sharing the wrong side. Sorry about that. Um, I'll be posting a recording of today's webinar on you set YouTube page. Um, and I'll be sending a follow-up email. And I'm going to ask Dr. Marianne and Jesse to share their slides um, 
and then any other information that they shared during their presentation, I'll try to add links where I can, because um, there were some really great resources highlighted in both. Um, and as a reminder too, if you are doing the writing reflections, there were three for today. Uh, the first being one thing I learned from today's webinar was, and the second being in the film site visit extended cut from the fire a legacy of long leaf Jesse Bullock and Sean Benedict talked about uh, fire suppression completely changing the range of long leaf pine is fire suppression a concern in your community. Is there a goal of reintroducing fire to the landscape for your community, I think that was kind of touched on there at the end, which is great. Um, and Dr. Marianne Sayers presentation climate concerns in the southeast and south central for longleaf pine. She speaks to the uh, suitability of longleaf pine in the region under certain climate projections. Are there species of concern for your community or climate change considerations need to be a part of your planning process. So if you uh, get an opportunity to write up a short email answering those writing reflections and send them to me. Um, I'll check them off on your uh, loyalty checklist and um, I'll be looking at those between now and the next webinar to figure out who uh, gets the three incentive packages. And just to expand on what um, that last question there, because I, I think it was kind of touched on. Um, I think that uh, some of the climate change, the impacts of climate change to different species, we kind of have to search for funding. And I think that what Dr. Sayer's presentation did really well was look at a species that gets a lot of funding and a lot of research atten attention, lob lolly, um, and explains how it's maybe not suitable for climate. And I, I saw that as an opportunity to maybe come up with a, a way in which you could promote the planting or the restoration of longleaf pine by saying, maybe that's the route we should go because these are examples of where Bob Lolly has not looked like the most suitable uh, species for the future climate and where um, longleaf has looked a little better. So I just wanna share that. I thought that was a great aspect to your presentation. Well, Lolly, thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. I have uh, thoroughly enjoyed hosting all of these webinars. And I think the discussions and connections that we're making uh, are gonna really help to build a community of practice among forest and wetland staff in the USAT region. The next webinar in this series will be the closeout and reflection webinar for the series um, where there will still be some great presentations. Um, I'll also announce the incentive package winners. Um, it should be a really great webinar. So I encourage you to, to join us. Um, that will occur two weeks from now on Monday, September 26th from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Central. And we hope to see you all there. And again, if you have any of those reflections typed up, you can send them to me at tevert.usetting.org. And this uh, concludes our fifth webinar of the USET Forest and Wetlands webinar training series. I thank everybody for joining. Uh, Walali, thanks.